Okay. How many people use system suitability in their day-to-day -day activities in the lab? I got one. I got two, three, four. All right, that's not bad. It's more than none, so that's good. Does anyone not know what system suitability is? Just to raise a hand. Yep, that's more common. People tend to not know what it is than the population of people that use it. Uh, so this is, I'm going to share with you all of the mistakes I made in my graduate, postdoctoral, and scientific career that led me to love this boring topic of system suitability. Um, I don't have that many slides, so I can tell you a little story. When I went to grad school, I quit my high-paying job in the pharma industry to go learn about mass spectrometry because they wouldn't let anyone in, the, in my pharmaceutical research group touch a mass spectrometer unless you had a graduate degree. And I had a bachelor's, so I was out of luck. So after putting up with that for five years, like, I'm going to go learn mass spectrometry. And I decided to <laughs> learn one of the more difficult and challenging type of mass spectrometers in the field at the time, which was FTICR. Um, they're really not used much anymore, but a lot of the same techniques are, are used in Orbitrap technology. Anyway, so I, I started in a research group and I had a project laid out. They're like, there's this protein, we want to detect it in drug resistant cancer cells. It's like, awesome. And they said, we express this protein, so we've got a, something for you to play with and digest and work with. Like, even better. And so they gave me the protein. Everything is all, of course, a clear colorless solution. And you're like, all right. And you digest it. And I go to the mass spectrometer and I put my syringe pump in because for a single protein, you don't need to do much separation with FDICR. You can just infuse it and see all the peptides. And I saw nothing. Like, oh. Well, obviously, they didn't give me the right sample. <laughs> I mean, that just must have been water or something, right? Nope. So no one in my lab ever did anything to like check if the mass spectrometer was working right. Everyone just assumes I'm going to put really concentrated samples in the mass spectrometer and I'm going to see signal. I didn't have very concentrated samples. I had just whatever the enzymologists in my research group gave me. And then I had to do some sample processing. And so the first thing I did was, well, it's obviously not the instrument, right? The instrument's always working fine. So I took my sample to another instrument. And they, they infused it and saw these beautiful peaks. And I'm like, oh, thank god, at least the sample's fine. And then I'm like, oh, no, now our instrument isn't working. What the heck? And as it turned out, it was, it was one of many lessons I learned, which is just don't trust anything. Make sure you start with step A and go to step B. And if you skip a step for sake of time or for mm, kind of making things easier, you are always going to have to go back and repeat that step. And sometimes you'll have to go back several steps to repeat the one you missed. So. Early on in our CPTAC studies, we realized after our first study was published, we didn't have a system suitability metric or a system suitability method for our users to make sure their systems were running well. In that first study, we had eight different instruments, each, each one run by a different individual at a different site. And so how was there any way we would make sure that things were performing the right way other than these sample kits we sent out? Um, everyone had different experience levels, everyone calibrated their instruments at different times, everyone had slightly different HPLC setups. So aside from using our real samples and seeing what we got, we never did anything like this, which was to take a relatively simple known sample and to repeatedly analyze it in, in frequent time chunks longitudinally and make sure the system's performing well. So <coughs> to get to it, what is system suitability? Uh, this is stuff that I got from Wikipedia, from the FDA. These are standard definitions. These are the, the what I think are legitimate definitions. Uh, but to paraphrase, it's a way to make sure that your cohesive system, both the LC in our context and the MS, are performing to your expectations. And it's a way to monitor that every time before, after you do anything, before and after running samples, before and after upgrading instrument control software, before and after cleaning, getting a preventative maintenance, before and after the system breaks. It's a way to help diagnose when the system is not performing well and to begin to go take corrective measures. Um, and, and it's also a way, if you design a system suitability for your own lab properly, that you don't waste precious samples 
uh, worrying that it's the sample's fault that something bad happened instead of there's actually something wrong with your system. So this is, this was one of the first really cool plots we got out of Skyline that illustrates, this is real data. We had a lab that was very new to Nanoflow and the instrument operator, the, the postdoc that was running the system had never really done Nanoflow before. And this is before nano viper fittings where everyone did have to cut their few silica tubing with a blade and put in finger and the little sleeves and the ferrules and the fittings. They didn't realize how very meticulously careful you had to be in, in order to set up nano flow fittings in your chromatographic setup. And so when we first got their data back, we saw these nano flow peaks that were two minutes wide at the base. And that's horrendously terrible. We knew what they should look like. And so we went back and said, knowing what we know about what causes peak broadening like that. Um, and also the intensity of that peak is much lower than the one on the, on the left. We said, all right, go back, change your connections. They did, and they were able to generate the peak on the left. And so ideally, we began implementing this as a go, no go way to measure if your system is performing well. Is system suitability the same as QC? <clears throat> QC in this context is quality control. Um, many people tend to use the terms interchangeably. I think it's because it's easier to say QC than it is to say system suitability. Uh, but ultimately, a QC is different. So a quality control of your method is, so QC sample is something that you run when you're processing samples in a method that you've developed for those samples to make sure that your sample handling steps and your sample introduction steps and your detection steps come together and give you the expected results. Um, your QC samples may change when you're analyzing this panel of peptides or that panel of peptides. And that can be a problem, especially if you're in a lab with a shared instrument. If you're in a lab with a shared instrument, like when I started uh, one job I had, people would do what they called their system evaluation or system check and they would walk up to the instrument with their own set of peptides and their own gradients and they would run it and be like, eh, that looks pretty good. Or, oh, the, the signal's too low, let me see what I can do. And then they would finish what they did and then the next person would come up with their set of peptides and their method and they would run it. And there was no way to compare an apples to apples performance evaluation against these people's different methods because they're different methods, they're analyzing different analytes. And the point here, is that the QC is method specific. And so when, when you are running your method and your response curves, we generate these with low, medium, and high QC standards. That low is just above the LOQ, the high is just below the upper linear range, and the middle is somewhere in the middle. And you make these samples so that you know what the expected results will be, and you see if that's what you get. And it also, they may or may not take into account sample prep. So you may have a QC that uh, you spike peptides into plasma that's already digested or proteins or uh, yeah, peptides into plasma that's already digested. You may spike proteins into plasma that's not digested or so on so that you can incorporate different parts of the workflow. But that's really to assess the performance of your workflow and how well you prepared the samples. It, it doesn't necessarily measure just the LC and MS performance. It does take it into account, but any variability it measures there is added on to the variability of your sample preparation methods. So that's why QC and system suitability are different. System suitability <coughs> is designed for long-term system evaluation. So for those of you, which it seems like a lot, do not have a system suitability method, take your time in designing one. Look for reagents that are commercially available. Ideally, they don't have to be expensive. They can be a VSA digest, cytochrome C, they can be synthetic peptides. There's a lot available. Um, they don't even necessarily have to be high purity. You just need to establish a method where you see a bunch of peaks over your entire gradient so you can monitor chromatographic separation. And you wanna make sure that you can prepare enough of the sample so that you can monitor this sample for a long period of time. And if you make batches of samples, then you can uh, have a, a, an overlay period where you're comparing an old batch to a new batch to make sure that they, they, the samples themselves, give the same result in the instrument at the same time. And there's not 
batch to batch variability. Um, you always want to use the same gradient. It doesn't have to be your method gradient. I've designed a system suitability method that is, it's about 45 minutes inject to inject with nanoflow chromatography. It can be used with a trapping column and without a trapping column. And it was designed specifically for our engineers who focus on the mass spectrometer. They come in, they try to fix the mass spec. And all of our engineers don't touch the LC, especially if we have customers who have a thermo mass spec and a waters LC. Those engineers don't want to touch anything because they're going to be in trouble for breaking it if it doesn't work. So they fix the MS, they do their infusions, and then they just slowly back away. And we know that a lot of customers say, no, I want to see peaks. I want to see chromatographic peaks eluding and detected in my mass spectrometer before I sign off anything. So we have a method where we're using a, a relatively inexpensive commercially available peptide where we target a bunch of peptide peaks, a bunch of transitions, and we make sure that the peak shape is appropriate, the retention times are reproducible, and the peak areas are reproducible. Those are the three main and simplest metrics you can follow, and Skyline helps us immensely with that. <clears throat> when should you run a system suitability evaluation? Do you just do it before a study and that's it? I mean, ideally, before a study is the best time because you want to make sure before you embark on a large study where you've done hours and days or weeks of sample prep that you're going to have a good system to measure those results. Um, I, I recommend all the time, um, obviously, before unknown samples, if you're going to run something where you don't know what to expect, then you want to make sure the system is running properly. I, I recommend periodically, um, daily to weekly, depending on your instrument use. Um, what I also recommend is I set it up so that I bracket my sample sets and I sort of do the balance of how many sample runs am I willing to throw out if my system started failing and it failed in the middle of that sample set. And so if you have a good performing system suitability run and a bad one and 10 samples in between, you might say, ah, okay. But if you do it every 100 samples and those 100 samples span three days, you just lost three days of time and all of those samples. So the frequency of your system suitability measurements are entirely up to your fit for purpose, what works for your lab, your method lengths, and so on. Um, and again, it doesn't have to be the same. If you're running a 90-minute data dependent or a 90-minute PRM method, your system suitability doesn't have to be 90 minutes. You can make it much shorter as long as it gives you an idea of how your system's performing. Uh, right, so before and after changes to hardware and plumbing, if you go from a non-trapping column setup to a trapping column setup, run your system suitability. Don't use real samples that just waste them. And you can make sure that everything's running properly. Peak shapes don't change, retention times don't change before and after changes to software. So this is something I didn't really realize until I started working for a company um, that, that I, I talk to the software developers who write the code that controls the firmware on the computer, on the instrument, on the mass spectrometer. And there are just a lot of places things can go wrong. I mean, if you think about it, like Skyline Daily, you, you know, it's a daily version. And so Brendan makes some changes. He does extensive testing. The, the, the vendors do too, but ultimately when you create a new feature or fix something, there is a potential something else could break. And that could affect the RF that's applied to your quadrupoles, and all of a sudden it could shift the mass to charge of your peaks. And so what, what would that do? Well, because you're isolating a peak at this mass to charge, if your peak should be in the middle, but it shifts a little bit, now your intensities are gonna go down because it's all controlled by software. So I always make sure if, if someone's like, oh, you need to test this new beta version, I'm like, oh, let me run my system suitability first, do the software, run it again. It's just, it's safe. It helps protect yourself. Uh, definitely, anytime you think your system is not performing optimally, if you run a sample that's a non-system suitability sample and you get a result that's questionable, very next sample should be system suitability. And then this is probably the most important. When you think your system is performing optimally, take a lot of measurements of that so you know exactly how it should be performing. Um, right after install, set it up, run this thing. If you have multiple models of the same, or multiple instruments of the same model, run the same method on all of them. Make sure that they are very, very similar, if not exactly the same, because they should be. Okay, so that's how we use system suitability, but 
or how, how we set it up to acquire it, but what are the metrics? How do we interpret it? Um, so for our, what we do, we've got it broken down into two sections, the mass spectrometer and the HPLC. And these are very simple. There are many more aspects that you can evaluate from your data files. Um, we look at chromatograms, retention times, peak areas. Those are the very simple, high-level things that you can observe. Mass, accurate mass, for example, uh, peak width. Um, and I'll show you software that looks into many other things in your data files. But from a very simple level, things that can even be done in Excel, but thank goodness for Skyline, it does a lot of these things already. You can look at the MS response, and, and that will relate to the sensitivity. So if you normally inject 10 femtomoles of something on your column per system suitability and you get a peak area of 1,000 arbitrary units, and then one day you inject it and it's 100, probably something's wrong. So that peak area change is something to pay attention to. The background in your signal. So what I mean by this is uh, normally we don't really pay attention to background unless our peaks are very, very tiny because the background gets pushed down as our peaks grow visually in the plots. But if you're, even if you still have a very intense peak, but like the, the jitter in the baseline comes up, that's something to pay attention to. I saw in a lab once where they had uh, their, their chromatographic peaks and nice and sharp, looking really good. And then in one run, the baseline had this vertical jump. And then it just had this elevated baseline for the rest of the gradient. Like, what the heck is going on? That is not normal. No chemical sample could do that. And so as it turned out, there was something going on with the electrometer. The electrometer is part of what gives you your signal at the, at the back end of the mass spectrometer, this particular kind. And there had been some cleaning of the ducts in the lab, <laughs> and a bunch of air movement had changed something and like flicked the electrometer and caused this electronic response that was not normal. And it, it didn't cause all of the peaks to get higher. They were still the same height, but now the baseline just moved up. So their signal to the noise decreased. And so these are all things that can happen. I've seen a lot and um, are just easy to pay attention to. The SRM transition ratio, so this is that product ion relative ratio. When you look at a single spectrum and look at all the Y ions related to one another, they should always be the same on the same instrument under the same conditions. Um, precision, so whether this is mass accuracy or uh, resolution, um, as long as your instrument is set up the same way, you should always get the same results. And then for chromatography, obviously, retention time. If your peaks are eluding 10 minutes earlier or 10 minutes later, that is unacceptable. Uh, peak shape, you should never have a peak. Whoops, wrong way. You should never have a peak that's asymmetric. You should never have a peak that's as asymmetric. If you do, you either have stuff co-eluding with it or you've got bad connections in your system and dead volumes and mixing going on, and that is unacceptable. Um, Chromatographic resolution, so resolution is how well two peaks are separated. This is affected by a lot of column-based things, like the more beads you have in your column, the longer your columns are, the better separated your peaks are, uh, and the smaller the diameter of those beads. So if you have two columns that are the same length, but one has smaller diameter beads, it has more beads in it. And so you should get better separation. And as long as you're using the same column, the same type of column to monitor these things, you should always get the same results unless your column's beginning to, to age. And then carryover. Um, carryover is something, we will run a system suitability run after uh, the highest concentration point for two reasons. One is we wanna see how much is potentially left in the, in the LC and uh, system that carries over into the next run, but also we wanna sort of minimize it for any subsequent uh, actual peptide runs after that. Um, and we always do run a blank in between that, but it's, a, it's another good time to look at carryover. Okay. <clears throat> so chromatographic resolution is different than resolution of your mass spectrometer. And this is what I consider the first type of resolution. And you can calculate it by looking at the retention time of two, there's the equation here, the retention time of two peaks and the width of those two peaks. So the, the higher the <coughs> resolution, in your chromatography means the better separated 
and or the narrower those peaks are. So if you begin, to, if this is what you would normally expect and you do plug in the numbers to get your resolution value, but then this is what you see after three days, this to me could be that the column is aging or that you have some poorly fitted connections in your system and it's causing mixing and then those peaks are beginning to broaden. We tend to see things like this um, in high flow if there are problems with the connections. If you have an integrated spray tip on your column and there's a, like a pico frit, for example, the column is packed right into the tip. It is unlikely that this is being caused by connections after your bed, your column packing bed, right? Because there are no connections after. So obviously you would want to look at things before it. But the, the point is we don't want to see this and we do want to see this. And so you need to begin to tune your eye and any kind of software to help you with this process because you can do this quantitatively, not just qualitatively. So one of the first papers that came out, again, I'm talking about CPTAC, <laughs> is this, they call it the metrics paper. And this was done in, a, again, a large collaboration. We had NIST, the National Institute of Statistical Standards, of National Institute of Statistics. Thank you, uh, <laughs> those guys. <laughs> and um, they took data that was acquired from data dependent runs from a, a large number of sites uh, looking at a, a variety of samples and decided what can we pay attention to, what can we pull from the raw data files to monitor over all of these data sets and these runs. And so they split it, this is from a paper that was published in 2010 uh, in molecular and cellular proteomics, so you, it should be free. Um, but they broke it down to chromatography, so going from where you would introduce your sample chromatography then to the ion source and then peptide identification, MS2, dynamic sampling, how fast does your mass spectrometer work in to do its job, and MS1. And so there, I believe, if you go to that website, there should be a tool that allows you to take a raw file, If and, and it, I don't believe it's um, vendor specific, but you should be able to look at all of these types of metrics and see how your system is performing. This is really complicated though. There are a lot of things here, right? Yeah, that's too much, too much. I think it's too much. <laughs> um, so now we know how to get system suitability data, uh, at least a little bit, or when to do it. What can you use as a sample? Uh, so it depends on where you're coming from. Obviously, academic research labs may not have access to a large budget, and so buying isotopically labeled standards that are $500 a vial or like, mm, that's, that can be um, cost prohibitive, but it doesn't have to be that expensive. The only thing I would recommend is if you have somebody making something in your lab that will function as a system suitability, um, that you, you pay attention to these criteria. So you want something that doesn't change with time. If you prepare a stock solution and aliquot it and put it in the freezer and it's enough to last a month, you want the one you use on day one to have the same response as the one you use on day 30, obviously. Um, you don't want peptides or whatever it is to degrade over time. You don't want them to hydrolyze and fall mm -hmm. apart. You don't want them to precipitate. You know, the, So it's worth, uh, if you have the time, um, and you, or if you are a grad student or have grad students who are like, I have a great idea for a project, you could set your lab up and, and figure out the best type of sample without necessarily purchasing something. Um, but if you have the budget, purchasing something is a little bit easier because companies like Pierce and Promega, Biognosis, they do stability testing on their peptides. They're synthesized. It's just easy. Uh, so there's that. Ideally, if you, if you have a system that's dedicated for proteomics, it, make it a peptide sample. That just makes sense. Um, if you're in a, like a core lab where the mass spectrometers are used sometimes for small molecules, sometimes for peptide proteins, then y you may be able to create a method that perhaps mixes the two, and so you can look at singly charged mm -hmm. stuff as well as doubly charged peptides. Um, but make it something that is relevant to your lab because th it doesn't make a lot of sense to me, and I know a lot of customers when they think about calibrating their mass spectrometer, they're like, these are 
polymers and they're singly charged and I detect peptides and I know people who decided they wanted to change the calibration many years ago and we're going to calibrate on peptides like but that's not what the software developers that wrote that instrument control software want you to do and that's not what any testing has been done and you're going to be the lone system and now if something breaks it's going to be harder to diagnose so always follow manufacturer recommendations but make your system suitability and your evaluation of your system relevant to what you do you'd like something that has minimal carryover uh, obviously you don't want to run something with plasma in it if you're doing a lot of plasma analysis because you don't want it to carry over into your samples that will potentially cause uh, issues inexpensive is ideal the, the prices are coming down these days but it's something to keep in mind because you will be using it um, but remember if you're doing nano you can inject a very small amount so if you're doing high flow you can inject 10 to 20 times that um, so you tend to not use a ton again ideally it would be a mixture of several analytes uh, a couple of labs I've worked for in the past has anyone ever heard of the glue fib peptide right so it's glue fibrinogen it, it ionizes beautifully and it fragments beautifully and it's one peptide and people would just inject that and be like, oh, everything looks great. And you're like, but it's one peak in your entire gradient. Like, put other stuff in there. So if you can make it a mixture, that would be good because then you can look at the effect of your chromatography because things can happen at the back end of your gradient that don't happen at the front end of your gradient, like the delivery of acetonitrile. Obviously, you're going to get more acetonitrile at the end of your gradient. And if the pump delivering that acetonitrile is not working, you won't see that effect for your early eluding things, but you will for your later eluding things. So you, you need to pick something that spans the entire chromatographic range. Um, and again, commercially available in QC really just makes it easy. Uh, so here are some examples. Cell lysate digest, digested in bulk and aliquoted. I know labs that will grow cells, lyse them, digest them, and aliquot them in 10 microliters and put them in the boxes with 100 in a box. And then anytime someone wants to do data dependent runs, they'll grab one, inject it, and, and have a consistent sample stock um, that they can compare their instruments with. Synthetic peptide standards, I think personally, are a little easier um, because that's what I've worked with and, and I think proteomes are a little complex. Uh, simple protein digests like cytochrome C, BSA, these are all commercially available and already digested and they should be of good quality if you're purchasing them from a reputable company. Um, NIST standards, if you have to do very precise measurements, they have gravimetrically measured and, and precisely quantified samples that you can invest in, um, but those probably will be a little more costly. Isotopically labeled compounds, if you're concerned about things that may contaminate your sample, but you wanna have something similar to your sample, this is a good way to have that. Um, and the one that I prefer is peptides spiked into a complex background. So when I run a system suitability, I sort of want to make sure that my system is running the way it should for a real sample without wasting a real sample. So I use a cell lysate digest that is commercially available and I spike the heavy PRTCs into it. And so every injection is really similar to what I normally analyze. And I look at not just the PRTCs, but I've picked out some peptides from the, the, the matrix as well because I'm on a triple quad, so I can look at hundreds of peptides. Any questions so far? Okay. <clears throat> so a fit for perfect purpose or universal system suitability, this kind of gets back to the QC versus system suitability. And there are a lot of shades of gray when it comes to discussing these particular topics. Um, so a fit for purpose is kind of like that QC type of uh, sample where it's identical. You're monitoring peptides, this should be peptides. Um, it reflects the assay performance. So it looks at noise, carryover, retention time, chromatographic resolution. I should have put sensitivity on here, peak area. And then universal, this is a common setup. Now ideally, you, you wouldn't want to have to change your column or go to a trap if you don't normally use a trap to monitor your system suitability. You, you should have something that is the general chromatographic setup because that's usually the thing that's uh, most changeable in the lab. Um, and again, make it something that, that is 
most commonly used in your lab so that you don't have to do a lot of changing. Um, but there is a way to find sort of an agreement between these two, especially if you have systems that are somewhat dedicated for their uh, measurement purposes. Okay, so now we've picked a standard, we've figured out kind of how to set something up in a very loose way, and we can go into specifics later if you have questions about how to do it in your lab. But how would you assess normal system performance once you started generating system suitability data? So the way that I would recommend it, if you've never done it before, is follow your vendor instructions for tuning and calibrating your MS and for tuning and calibrating your LC. So for LC, you would want to do flow rate checks or um, some pumps have a, f have a flow rate calibration set up. Um, and that's something I would make sure you do before starting to generate system suitability data because you want your system suitability, you want, ideally, you want your system suitability data to be like, yeah, everything's working great. You don't want to start generating it and have be like, oh, well, this is what my system suitability data looks like, and then you tune and calibrate, and it'll look so much better, right? So start with something, that, a fresh system that's, that's well um, calibrated. And then what you want to do is monitor the variability of these metrics over time so that you can begin to see trends and changes. For example, if you're running your system and you see your retention times trending in a later and later and later pattern, then that's not good and you need to stop that. Um, you don't want that to happen in your real sample and this is the kind of thing that can help you. Um, also, if you see your peak areas for this particular sample getting smaller and smaller and smaller, that's another problem. Um, usually that means something's probably dirty uh, or your auto sampler might be picking up air and the air little volume's getting bigger and bigger. So there are all, a lot of things to explain what's going wrong, but you need to have the data to see if something's going wrong. Um, right, so keep track of it. Look, look to your vendor and ask if there are performance specifications for each of the components, the LC and the MS, and then note when the performance deviates from that. It may not be significant initially, but uh, if, if it is a trend and the trend continues, it will become significant. Um, and then if you have the luxury of having sev several of the same LCMS setups in your same lab again, run it consistently on all of those systems. Don't have it be like, oh, this is Joe's system. He likes to run this sample with this method. Well, I use the same sample, but I like to run it with this method because it's faster. And then Jane over here is like, I don't even like that sample, but I'll use your method because you can't compare anything then. Right? So keep everything as consistent as you possibly can. All right, so how do you evaluate the system suitability data? This is where Lindsay's going to go into a lot more detail on some of these specific uh, things. Early on, there was this awesome executable file called raw meat that you could use. It was only specific to Thermo. It was made by a software engineer that was able to take a raw file, uh, like for example, from a high-res instrument or an ion trap and see how many MS1 scans were in the whole file, how many data-dependent MS2 scans were collected in the whole file, um, what the average injection time was for those MS2 scans, and all of these metrics that we never even usually look at um, and it would be able to, to get it. Now, it's not currently supported, but I did find a link for it, <laughs> ironically, on the Washington UW website. So uh, it may work. I doubt it'll work on the newer instruments. Like, it probably won't work on um, Fusion or Fusion Lumos. I'm not sure if it'll work on a QE, but I know people in the past had used it. Uh, the NIST metric, so that's the website from the paper I had presented earlier. Obviously, Skyline is a great way. You can just keep adding raw files into Skyline and look at retention times, peak areas, peak areas CV, retention time CV. And then Panorama is another even better one. So if you have multiple systems or you don't want to store everything on a local PC or you are having people get files from different areas, you can use Panorama, um, which will take all of the data and maintain it for a much longer period of time and probably better organized. And then there's auto QC. So this is a this is a really cool one. I'm gonna admit I have yet to try it, but the premise here is you set up a folder on your computer where all of your system suitability runs go. And then this software 
grabs it whenever it just looks in the folder periodically and grabs it and I think puts it up to panorama and then it, it yeah okay and it, it, it allows you to to keep a running track record of a system um, at a pretty much the click of a button and it processes the data for you so you don't have to be like oh they're like eight system suitability runs that I haven't put in Skyline yet. Well, this does it for you. Retention time viewer is something that was developed before Skyline had that retention time plot, so probably not worth um, looking at right now, but it was a nice way to see, uh, to compare retention time across even different systems. So you could take retention time of a peak uh, from a particular sample and method on system A, B, C, D and see how they line up. Um, so an other people I've seen use number of peptide IDs. So if you run data dependent and, and you do a lot of discovery type research on, in proteomics, um, you're obviously not quantifying anything, but you are detecting a lot. So one of the metrics can be how many identified peptides do you get? And some people have a, a, have a range. And after the system's cleaned and calibrated, they get at the high end of the range. And after several weeks to months of running, you know, lots of proteomic samples, they may get at the low end of the range and when they get out of that range, they'll say, oh, we have to stop and clean the ion source because that's what gets dirty in the mass spectrometer. And this is a decent metric, but I'm gonna show you why it's not the best. Uh, in the absence of all of these other things that are freely available, uh, you could use Excel. You could just peak area. Uh, what I don't recommend is eyeballing it. I was at a, a customer lab last year and they, <laughs> they had a table cut out on the bottom of their monitor and they would run their, their system suitability sample and they would open it up in the vendor software and they would look at the peak area and they would look at the peak area and be like, good. And they didn't like process it. They didn't make a recording of it. They're, it was all manual. It was just not ideal. And especially if you're going to be having multiple people in the same lab, you want to begin to know when something goes wrong and have a record <coughs> of it. Um, and then check with your instrument vendor because some companies may have this. This is really something that is more, correct me if I'm wrong, like small molecule world is like probably way more into this decades before proteomics. They've been way ahead of us for many, many, many years on many different aspects. And we're beginning to realize a lot of the lessons we're learning the hard way are things that are already in the literature. Um, and we should have been paying attention to just now we have multiply charged precursors and lots of different product ions um, to, to apply using small molecule based approaches. Okay. So qualitatively, this is like what my customer lab did. You know, this is what you want to see. This is the ideal. Someone might have a picture of this next to the system and be like, this is what we got to see. If you don't see it, oh, that's terrible. And you'll go and fix it. What's really important is it's not always that obvious, number one. And number two, even if it is, you should, you should somehow make a note of it, whether it's in a log book or a screenshot and you put it in something electronically. Because when you have a problem like that and you figure out how to fix it, you're gonna wanna know what you did the next time you see it. Or you're gonna wanna pass on that information so the next time somebody sees that, they're like, oh, Joe had this happen a couple of months ago and he did like six things and I guess I'll just, replace the check valves and put a new ro rotor on and a stator, because those are 1200, that's really not a big deal, right? We'll just put a new stator on our auto sample. There are all these things that you don't have to do, and if you can make a note of it, um, even if they're not as obvious as this, it will help the, the, the fitness, the quality of your system and your data. Uh, so in Skyline, one of the easiest things to do is look at retention time by replicate. So view, retention time plot, and you can, order in uh, acquisition time. And so that's really nice. Uh, what I like to do is I don't usually have this spread out like that on the bottom of the plot. I usually have it stacked up over here. And so even if I had a lot of runs, it's easy to see where things jump or if there are trends. Um, here, it may not be as obvious. This is the first injection and then it eludes earlier and then it goes a little earlier for a little while and then it begins to go a little later. But it's, again, a visual, nice way to see that something's going on. And then there are three ways you can use the peak area view. So if, if you have a Skyline file open and you go view to peak area and you look at, and this, this is the peptide area view. So this is view by peptide. 
And then you can sort these peptides by the order that they are in your document, which is fine. If you have your favorite peptide on top, then you'll always see that peptide here. Or you can sort them in order of retention time, which is more valuable because these would be your early eluders, these would be your late eluders. You see problems at either end, then it could be a chromatographic system and so on. Um, <laughs> If you right click in that view and change it to peak area CV, um, this is peak area CV by peptide. So we have been looking at peak area CV by sample groups yesterday, but this is showing over all of the runs that you do, what's the CV of these peptides. And again, this should be random and low. If you see that they are trending and you have high CVs at the end, again, that's probably a chromatographic problem um, or vice versa. They're high at the beginning and low at the bottom. And then this is a peptide replicate view. So this is, if you go view by replicate uh, and pick a peptide, this is showing you the peak, at raw peak area, right? And again, this should be steady and sort of random. You shouldn't see it consistently going up or consistently going down. Um, yeah, as far as I know, there are not any pre-designed reports in Skyline for uh, interpreting this so this is still a very visually based way but it's a good way to start and then there's software like AutoQC that will help with the interpretation um, also just to point out so this is showing the average peak area from all of the runs that would have been in that file and then the little error bar is one standard deviation and you would expect the bigger peak areas to have bigger deviation um, and as you can see this is from the same set they don't have bigger CVs uh, because of bigger peak area divided by bigger standard deviation or vice versa makes a small CV. Jim, <coughs> Jim just gone to export the CVs to a report. Yes. Oh, to a report? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. How? Yeah, who said that? Thank you. I thought CVs you couldn't. I thought you could. I mean, you can right click and copy oh, data. I did, I did it for this, for this. You did it? Oh, yeah. that's so cool. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Result summary. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, so this is a, a, a real example of real data where during our CP tax study we had people running the system suitability once we developed it and we wanted to see what kind of system performance we were getting back. Now remember that in the, the CP tax study we had different instruments for our second study so we cannot compare raw peak areas because instruments process and, and, and um, that called inflate the data differently so the absolute peak area is not something we can compare but we can look at the percent CV so this is showing that these system suitability peptides eluding early eluders late eluders average peak area and their standard deviation so this was a lab um, this, that that did not compare to the other labs that were in the study because the peak areas of these late eluding peptides was very very low compared to the other labs um, and then when we converted this plot to peak area CV, this is the 20% cutoff. Because we're looking at raw peak area, 20% is, is a pretty decent thing to shoot for. And you'll notice that at, at the later eluding peptides, they're, all of their peak area or CVs are quite high. They're all over that 20% mark. And so we went back to that lab and said, all right, something's going on with your system. Do the flow calibration. We're pretty sure it's LC related because it, it's a retention, it's correlates with retention time. And they found out that somebody in their lab that they had an exigent system where you do a flow calibration step through of the pumps and somebody put the wrong numbers in for the delivery of their solvent B. So pump B was pumping half as fast as it should have been. And so all of those peaks were just blobby and spread out and not well retained and they didn't look good. So once they went through and recalibrated, then we saw this peak profile. And this should look similar to your tick too. Like if you have your chromatogram in your, in your processing software and you look at all your peptides, these, these peak areas of your peptides. So this should be similar to what you see in a tick. Um, 
their peak areas returned, and then their CDs went to less than 10% over <coughs> like 10 injections. So this is a really good example of how to use it. Longitudinal system performance is when we had a lab, and these are date stamped, we had the labs inject a sample every eight hours or so, I think, in between running their different method with their different peptide targets. And this is an example over uh, eight to 12 hours, over 10 days, it acquired all this data. And the peak areas of this one peptide look pretty stable. And a different lab, who actually had to run for a little bit longer, 12 days, um, they had pretty good stability until here. And then ooh, they started going down. If it's affecting your system's suitability, chances are it's gonna affect your peptides. And then around here, the, this lab knew that that is a symptom of the ion optics getting dirty in the source. So they stopped everything, took the source off, cleaned it, popped it back on. With a triple quad, it takes just like an hour, so it's not a big deal. And then boom, their signal went right back up. Nothing else has changed. No, this was before auto QC. Oh. So this is just the skyline plots. Uh, okay. Yep, so just in skyline. Is this the one peptide? Yep, just one peptide. Oh. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I, all of them showed the effect, but just just one is all we needed to really. So uh, maybe a tangent. Uh, that twenty percent CD threshold. Is there a sentimental paper or something? What's the uh, who came up with that? I mean, is that widely accepted that? Who would you cite? Yeah. Yes. Um, so, what's that? Yep. 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 Well, you can cite the FDA guidelines. Um, and I, I was looking for those recently, and I think there was one in 1990. I, I'm sure they've been updated since then. Yep. And so, and those are mostly set up, obviously, for pharmaceutical companies that have to develop quantitative methods and so on. And it usually holds true not just for mass spectrometry data, but for uh, like UV data if you do LCUV. Um, but yeah, that would be the place. Uh, here's another example of longitudinal monitoring on a SIEX instrument where you can just again look at raw peak area over thousands and thousands of different samples and establish an average response and then uh, like a threshold of how, how high and how low are you willing to let that signal wander before you do something about it. Usually no one gets upset when your signal's really high, but you know. Yes. You import them. You would import them. So the way that I do it and the way that Auto QC does it automatically is every time I run one, I import it and save it and then import it again and just repeat that process. I don't necessarily individually look at each file. I look at the summary plots because it's just so much easier. <laughs> Right, so if the question was if, if you see this effect, and obviously it's visual, if you don't have an internal standard, you have to look at raw peak area. But if you have an internal standard, um, presumably the peak area of the internal standard would go down to the same extent as your analyte, and the peak area ratio should not be affected if it is a, a factor of the sensitivity thing. However, if you think about going through and characterizing and establishing your assay, if you inject 10 femtomol of your peptide on column, you want a peak area of a certain amount because the LOD calculations and the percent CV calculations are really rooted into the variability of the raw peak area data. And so while you may get decreasing signal of both and your peak area is fixed, that's actually one really good way to check um, what may be going on is if your peak area ratio between your light and heavy is fixed, but the peak area is down, then you know you injected 
the sample, you know you added, you prepared the sample properly, probably, um, but m maybe 50% of the sample was injected. But because everything's all mixed together, your light and heavy got in there to the same amount. Um, maybe they, they, maybe your source is dirty, or there's some other factors. But it paying attention to that, if you have that information, is valuable. So if we saw this uh, in the system suitability, I mean, and remember, these are taken every eight hours, and so the difference between that one and that one's not big. That one doesn't change. The, the differences are very small, but when you stack them up, you're like, oh man, my sensitivity's going down over the course of two days. Um, it's something you might not notice if you're just looking at peak area ratio in your sample, right? Until all of a sudden your coefficient of variation or percent RSDs become very, very high. Okay. And again, if, if you don't have access to some of the software, you can take a lot of the data and plot it in Excel and get the same kind of information. Um, but hopefully no one really has to do that. <laughs> So another type of system suitability method you can set up is uh, for a, a, this was on a Waters instrument where they set up a targeted or a pseudo SRM or pseudo MRM, meaning they targeted particular peptides in the sample and, and set it up. You can see uh, the time range that they set them up and they were doing MS2 on particular peptides and then imported the data into Skyline. And this is longitudinal measurements over one year, and raw peak area ratios, or sorry, raw peak areas, retention times. I mean, in here, um, they probably do some things like change a column or whatever, because you can't expect everything to be perfect without intervening over a whole year, um, because otherwise the vendors wouldn't make any money, because we have to come in and do stuff and upgrade you, and you have to buy things. Um, and so this is, again, just another example. Now. Going back to the proteomics type workflows where people look at peptide IDs, do, do, does anyone in the room do that? Do you run data dependent runs and just they're like, oh, I got 20,000 peptide IDs, my system's running fine. Anyone in here do that? I imagine I have a few standards. Yes. And then I'll the Yeah, okay, oh good. Okay, good. So yeah, using a combination of those I think is very smart. But if you solely rely on a uh, peptide ID, you could be missing aspects of your system performance that are, that are going bad. So this is the same data. You look at the raw peak area, like everything seems to be fine. There's some stuff going on in the middle. But here, you're like a lot lower than on average the rest of the peak area responses. And w if, we looked, if we only looked at the data in terms of sequence coverage or numbers of peptide hits, so this is, um, it was monitoring this protein, uh, I don't know, it's up there somewhere, from Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And this is in red is showing the percent coverage of that particular run where you see this one peak area for this one peptide. And that's pretty good. I think the percent peak area is 48%. Here it's 46%. Here it's 49%. But the peak area is like half uh, or less than what it is over here. So just because you're still getting great peak area ratios or because you're getting good peptide IDs and then hitting the same marks every time doesn't mean that your absolute signal is okay. And so that's why for me, I would rather take my run, put it into Skyline, which takes like two seconds and look at a peak area than I would to take my data file, put it into a search mm -hmm. engine, wait for, I don't know how long it takes, probably longer than two seconds though, right? and then find what the number is at the end. Um, you can use these, this information together though, and together it becomes a little more powerful. So how do you use it? <clears throat> this paper came out um, 2007, Chad Briscoe, and this just walks you through, uh, I mean, mostly pharmaceutical companies and regulated labs have to do this. Um, and we in the proteomics community had started off mainly from academic backgrounds, like what do we see in the sample, not do I see this every time, and how, how is it being measured, and what's the reproducibility of it. We're getting to that. And this kind of um, incorporation of system suitability will help. And so obviously it's just a flow chart, and you go with decision points and, and follow it. And I use this as a guide. So Lindsay will go over some of the newer tools that help in a more automated way. 
and make a data, data evaluation less subjective. Um, so this is something called S-PROCOP, uh, Statistical Process Control for Proteomic Experiment, so S-PROCOP. And this is, this came out of Michael Berriman's lab. He's at, is it NC State now? And this works very well with Skyline. You run your sample in targeted mode. Even if you're running on uh, HRA and platform in data dependent mode, you can still put the precursors into Skyline and monitor particular precursors of peptides that you know are in your sample, like PRTCs or HeLa peptides. Um, and then what this does is over time, longitudinally, it'll plot different metrics like peak area, retention time, um, and then it breaks down the data into a Pareto chart where each one of these bars is one of those metrics, and it tells you which one of them is most responsible for the variability based on the data. And so if you're seeing biggest changes in peak area, then that red bit might be related to peak area variability. And this is just a zoom in of what you would see in Skyline versus the output um, charts that come out of uh, S-PROCOP. And S-PROCOP is one of those tools that you can get. It's in the tool store, right? You can add it into Skyline. Okay. Okay, so in summary, I hope I've convinced you that getting a system suitability sample and method is worth your time. Um, and again, I didn't really go through it specifically, specifically, but documenting when things go bad and then saying what steps you took to fix those problems is really important. I mean, think about how many times you spun your wheels on something that someone else in your lab figured out. And then at a group meeting, they're like, oh yeah, if you see X happen, you just do Y. And you're like, yeah, I wasted three weeks and all of my samples on that. That happens in grad school a lot. Um, don't waste your sample making sure that your system's working, get a sample that is okay to waste. And then use system suitability to monitor changes in everything. Remember, even software, stuff that you wouldn't think has much of an effect can have a huge effect. And then also, keep examples of poor system suitability data. So if you do see something go bad, uh, look at the data file, open it up, and if you see the peak area is down, look at every aspect that you can of that data file, whether it's in Skyline or the, the vendor uh, qualitative data software package, and look at how everything is spaced, look at the peak areas, look at the, the smoothness of the chromatographic peak. Is it jittery or is it smooth? How many points do you have? It takes screen captures, put them in a, a PowerPoint file or something so that you have a way to keep track of some of these crazy things that always go on. And then here are some resources. Uh, these are some papers that I recommend um, because I found them to be very useful. And these are people that, that have done a lot of work in, in system suitability and make great evaluations and recommendations. All right, any questions on that? It's not really an exciting topic. I mean, you're not doing biology when you're running system suitability, but that's okay. Helps us get 